Um, good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for coming to today's lecture. My name is Mike Pitstick, and I am Associate Director of Annual Giving here at UD, and I'm happy to be with you today. Uh, Encore is a lecture series conducted by the faculty of the University of Dallas in conjunction with the Office of Alumni Relations. The lectures are offered to alumni and friends and reframe topics from the core curriculum in fresh perspectives. Today's lecture is co-hosted by Liberal Learning for Life's Studies in Catholic Faith and Culture program, which facilitates intellectual formation in the Catholic liberal arts tradition by offering video-based courses co-taught by UD professors. Videos like the one we'll watch together today are currently available for free. See the chat for links and for more information. We'll be watching Father John Byers' video from a 20 session course called The Person, History and Tradition. Since the course is co-taught by dozens of UD professors, today you'll first see Dr. Gregory Roper, who will introduce the course and Father John's presentation, followed by Father John speaking on Bricks and Clouds, the Monastic Search for God. There is a handout for this lecture as well, which you can find in the chat. After the video, Dr. Shannon Valenzuela, Affiliate Assistant Professor of English and Content Director for the Studies in Catholic Faith and Culture program, as well as UD alumna, will discuss the video with Father John, who is also an alumnus of UD. When Dr. Valenzuela and Father John open the discussion up to all of you, please use the raise hand function or a comment in the chat to indicate that you'd like to speak. We're expecting a larger group today, and so I may not see you raising your hand on video. Uh, you're also welcome to submit your questions or comments in the chat box at any time throughout the video and the lecture. Please do stay muted unless I call on you to speak, but you are invited to turn on your video at any time. If you have any technical problems or questions during the video or discussion, please message Alumni Relations for assistance. And now we'll go ahead and get started with the video. Now we're going to have a talk which, I'm not going to kid you, is dense. Father John Byer is back to talk about faith and reason. He starts with the atheist thinker Richard Dawkins. Right? As an atheist, Dawkins says, I don't need faith, I have reason. But Father Byer is going to ask, what is that reason based on? Can reason base itself on reason, or does reason have to base itself on something else? He's also going to go after Dawkins' notion that we who have faith aren't really seeing the truth of things. We're just making things up. We're just projecting things up into the sky like clouds and seeing shapes up in those clouds. Are we? Is faith that which just makes things up and reason is that which sees things clearly? Or does reason need to rest on something solid itself for reason to work? When I teach the Middle Ages, for instance, I propose to the students the following syllogism that everyone in the Middle Ages would have known implicitly and believed implicitly. So let's start through this little syllogism. God is infinitely rational. God is reason itself. Therefore, when God came to create the cosmos, God acted rationally. That is, he created a rational, reasonable cosmos when he created. And even when he created humans, he created us to be rational and to be able to use our reason. Therefore, we can study the cosmos because the cosmos is deeply reasonable, deeply rational in its very structures. And by studying the cosmos, we can therefore know something about the God who created the cosmos. Right? If we have reason, if God gave us that reason, and when he created the cosmos, it is rational and reasonable in its very deepest structures, then we can know the cosmos, and we can therefore know something about the God who created the cosmos. Now, every medieval thinker would have agreed to that, but that's the very thing that Dawkins challenges. He says that reason exists for itself, and reason is there for itself. And all of this talk of faith that we base reason upon is just kidding ourselves. It's just projecting shapes up into the clouds. Father Beyer is going to go after that very notion and try to provide a response to Dawkins that reason itself has to be based on a deep faith, on the God who created reason. And only in that way do we see the things of the world as knowable, intelligible, that they have a truth that is reasonable. Here's Father John Beyer. What could God, what could the possibility of God 
have to do with the life of my own mind? Does my own rational activity imply anything about the nature of reality, about its unity? Does the life of my heart, my faith, hope, and love have anything to do with the life of my mind? All right, so why do we trust reason? When and how was this verdict on behalf of reason made? Pope Benedict XVI in his address locates it in the monastic heart of the Western tradition. The idea that the monks were searching for God. That is, they were searching for the transcendent fulfillment of their every desire for happiness. The monks saw in themselves a life of reason among many other things, and they had the hope to believe that this reason was not made in vain, that it doesn't exist to be frustrated, but that it can find its fulfillment by looking out into the world. Before we explore this answer further, we have to ask ourselves one very important question. Who is God for the monks? Now, this might seem like an obvious question, but it really isn't. And in fact, I think the fact that we so rarely pose ourselves this question has a lot to do with the confusion and the atheism that reigns in our day. Because if you listen to any of the big scientific atheists, take Richard Dawkins or Daniel Dennett or Sam Harris, any of these folks, and you ask them, well, who is God, as you at least understand the Christian God to be, you're likely to hear something like the following. He's a big Superman. He's a powerful craftsman from a galaxy far, far away who molded our galaxy like we might, say, make a clock. And someone who intervenes from time to time, pulling the gears in response to our petitions. Miracles. Now, this is a pretty silly idea of God for which we have no rational evidence. And if I thought that were God, I would have to agree with Richard Dawkins, Dennett, and Harris, and the rest of them and say that's pretty silly. But the thing is, is that's not what the Christian tradition, at least the best lights of it, the great saints and theologians of the ages, have ever meant by God. It's not what St. Augustine or St. Anselm or the great monastic hearts of the tradition ever meant by God. So as we go on this journey and ask ourselves, what could God have to do with the life of the mind? Let's be very sure about what we do and don't mean by God. Okay, to dive deeper into this question, I'd like to follow the ideas of St. Anselm of Canterbury. St. Anselm is a monk who lives in the 10th and 11th century. He dies in 1109. He was born in Italy and was a monk in northern France at a place called Beck for much of his life until he became Archbishop of Canterbury. He wrote a work called the Monologion. The Monologion basically means, if you were to translate the title, something like a self-speaking or a soliloquy, a speaking inside himself. And in this work, he sets out to know God, as he says, by reason alone. That is, he doesn't want to rely on any extrinsic authority in his knowledge of God. He wants to be interiorly convinced by his own thought, by his own reason, that what he believes about God is true. Now, that doesn't mean he sets aside all faith. He sets aside all extrinsic authority, but he doesn't necessarily set aside all faith. And that's because one of the very first things he does in this book, when he's thinking with reason alone, is to ask his own reason whether or not it should believe something about the absolute. Now, if that sounds like a strange way to proceed, it's probably because we naive moderns tend uncritically to think that faith and reason are two fundamentally different paths, and that where you go down one path, say reason, you can't take a foot down the other, or where you go down the path of faith, you can't have anything to do with reason. But that's an assumption that we make that really wasn't true for most of the Western tradition. And so Anselm, when he sets out to think about God, he's doing it reason alone, but asking reason about its faith. Now, Anselm goes on in his Monologion to make a lot of very difficult metaphysical arguments, and I'll leave those to you and your interest. What I am prepared to present today in this talk is the distinction between what we would call today contingent and absolute reality. So Anselm, very reasonably, looks out into the world and he notices that it's full of good, existing, and intelligible or rational things. He also notices, quite reasonably, that all of these good, existing, and rational things 
don't exist through themselves. That is, there are innumerable conditions for the goodness, the existence, the intelligibility or rationality of all the things that we encounter in our physical experience. Take an apple, for example. The apple is good. Why is the apple good? Well, because there was good weather that sent a bunch of rain, or there was good soil that nourished the tree. Or you have a good child. The child is good because of the good parents and the good school and the good education and so forth. Or you have an apple at all. The apple's existing. Well, thanks to the apple tree or the child, thanks to the parents. Or the apple makes sense. That is, the apple has a form that I can understand and name apple, and I know what an apple is where the child makes sense. Now, these are all things that the apple and the child don't give to themselves. The intelligibility of the apple, its rationality, comes from all the physical, chemical, biological processes that go into the life of the tree, the germination of the apple. Now, Anselm calls all of these realities, apple, a child, and every other that we see, realities that exist through another. That is, there's a condition, there's a cause, there's something outside of itself that allows it to be good, to be at all, and to be intelligible. And it takes just very little reflection to see how everything we experience in the physical world is like that. Everything we experience exists through another, is good through another, makes sense through another. Now, here's the next step. This is the, this is the jump. Can all things be contingent? Can all things exist only through another? Or does there not have to be something that exists through itself? Something absolute that stands in relation to nothing in order to be good, to be, and to be intelligible. Anselm argues that absolutely, you must have an absolute. There must be something necessary, something existing through itself for anything else to be. Now why, why is that? If everything is contingent on something else, then nothing need be. But if nothing need be, then we have no way to account for why anything really is. Our account will just continue to pose new questions. If I ask, well, why is this there? Well, it's because of this other thing. Well, then why is that other thing there? Well, it's because of this further thing. Only if there is something for which that question no longer makes sense, that is something that doesn't exist through something else, can any of the things that follow ever be. And that thing, Anselm calls that which exists through itself, that which exists in relation to nothing else, that which is, in other words, absolute, not contingent, must exist. Okay, that was pretty heady. Here's an image to try to make a little more sense of it. Imagine, if you will, a stack of bricks, one depending on the other in order to stand, in order to be. Now, if those bricks are on the ground, you can easily see how one leans on the next. They're really leaning on it. One is really causing the other. Now imagine that same stack of bricks in that same order falling through the sky. There's no ground. Now, you can still imagine conceptually their relationships, one on top of the other, but one is no longer leaning on the other without the ground to uphold them all. They're just falling through the sky. Contingent things in the universe are like that. Without the absolute, we can conceptually imagine their relationships, but we would have no reason to believe they really are related, that one really is cause of the other, that one is actually leaning on the other. Just like those bricks falling through the sky, the things of this earth would be falling through our mind, as it were, without any grip on reality. At least we would have no reason to believe they are in reality. Now, what is true about the existence of things is also true about the rationality of things, or their intelligibility, their ability to be comprehended by us. The rationality or the intelligibility of things must precede my mind, just like the natural forms of things must precede my mind. Now, what do I mean? Imagine the clouds passing through the sky. And you look up at them and you see different images. There's an ice cream cone or a man with a fluffy beard. Those are not real things, obviously. There is no ice cream cone up in the sky. There's no man with a fluffy beard in the sky. What's happening there is that your mind is projecting that reality upon to something that's formless, something that in itself has no shape, 
at least no shape that's unified into a thing like an ice cream cone or a bearded man. Now, can our mind be like that in its gaze upon reality itself? Is the life of our reason just a constant projecting of its own forms onto things? Or is it not rather a looking onto things and a recognizing of a form that's already there? This is a problem for the scientific atheists or the likes of Dawkins and Harris and the rest. What they would like us to believe is that ultimately there are no living things out there. There if we see, say, an animal or a man or some living thing, it's really just a projection of our own mind upon what is really just particles in motion. Now, so far we've said something about who God is. God is the reason that we can look out into the world to all reality and expect to find rationality. He's the first thinker who allows us to think in return the first one who cognizes so that we can recognize, recognize. Now, why is it necessary to have a monastic heart? That's the thesis that I'd like to argue. Why, given what reason is, must we have a monastic heart? Why must we search for God in order to give a basis for any genuine culture? What does it mean to search for God? Okay, well, most people, I think, would admit that what I tried to outline above is very attractive and leading to human happiness. That is a rationality that extends through all things and that the life of my mind and heart, everywhere I look in reality, can discern between what is true and what is false, what is beautiful, what is ugly, what is good, what is bad, and so direct myself rationally through life. That everything ultimately is unified and harmonious under a single good. And what's especially beautiful about this, I think, is that the forces of division in our world, the things we see in our own heart or in our society, these do not have the first word, and therefore there's no reason we should think they have the last word. What comes at the beginning is an intelligible, reasonable, benevolent God. And everything he created, he created through this word, this benevolent, good, rational word. But here's the rub. To follow reason in this life, reason open to this widest of horizons, we need faith, and not just any kind of faith, because it's not enough for me to believe simply that this absolute reason exists. I also have to want it. That is, I have to love it and desire it. I have to have a living faith for it. In other words, we need a faith working itself out in love. Why? Well, just realize once again how this reason, this absolute reason behind all things, implicates all things. And so, sure, I can step into the science lab and expect to find the rationality of whatever I look at under the microscope. But if I'm to extend this vision for the rationality of all things coherently to the rest of my life, well, that means that I need to look upon myself in a new light. Everything I do, everything I think, those with whom I do it, all of this has a rationality that precedes my own mind. My life is waiting for me to recognize it, to discern in an intelligibility that I do not author, but that lays open for me to recognize. Everything about my life as a person emerges from this creative reason. And therefore I have purpose, I have meaning in this life but it's one that's waiting for me to recognize. It's not something I project onto the clouds. It's something I see in reality and accept. Now again, here's the rub, because this means I'm not projecting, I'm recognizing. And therefore to be rational in an important sense means to be humble. It means to be obedient, to follow reality wherever it leads. Are we ready to desire this absolute with such love, to believe in it that we search for it and long for it. The meaning of my life is waiting for me to recognize it. For it to be true, I must obey it. I must be humble before it. This one who authored all these persons and who underlies their intelligibility as individuals and as a community, this one who guides history sweetly and powerfully, who calls us each by name, 
this God is a person, infinitely more than any of us is a person. He too has reason and will and is therefore someone who knows and loves us. And so as I reason about reality, that means ultimately that I'm in dialogue with this one behind all reality. This creative reason is someone before whom I can speak and stand in his presence. And that thinking is in an important way, just the same thing as praying. It's recognizing forms given to me from another. To see the creature for what it is, is at the same time to see the creator. Again, to think well takes humility. It takes faith, hope, and love. But see, once again, the prize for this humility is that everywhere we look in life, personally, scientifically, philosophically, politics, everywhere we look, we can expect to find a benevolent reason, a person guiding us to something that makes sense, that's good and worth pursuing. There is no reason to be listless, bored, or disoriented in life. On the contrary, we have every reason to expect for there to be meaning and purpose everywhere we look. The postmodernists and Richard Dawkins would say, we're just making that up. We're projecting those shapes onto the clouds. The Catholic viewpoint is that we can, with our reason, know the deeper reality of things because God is infinitely rational and he made those things rationally knowable. Philosophy can know a great deal of the truth of things. We are made to know things. So here we are, historical beings in time with the traditions, the truths that are handed on to us, the truths that we can know with our own minds. Beings in time, beings who can move out of time by knowing the truth of things. Therefore, using our intellect is not ivory tower nonsense. It's not just fiddling around with our minds, doing nothing. The true Catholic sense of reason, of history, of tradition, is that we can use our minds to know the truth deep down of things. And that itself, as Father Beyer says, is part of the great search for God. Doing intellectual work properly, faithfully, is the search for God. I will now turn it over to Dr. Valenzuela to talk with Father John and then begin to take your questions. Uh, once they're ready for questions, as I mentioned before, um, given our relatively large group, please use the raise hand function, which depending on your settings might be found at the bottom of a participants list or a comment in the chat to let me know that you'd like to speak. Otherwise, please do remain muted. Thanks so much, Mike, and I just want to thank you all for being here this afternoon. I'm really looking forward to speaking with Father John about this wonderful video. There's so much in this video that I think is well worth um, thinking about and just meditating on. But I wanted to start by going back um, to this very important point about there being an end point to the chain of causation, right? So that there is a being who brought all things into existence but that itself is not caused by something else. And so Father John, I wonder if you could talk to us a little bit about um, how that's so reassuring, um, why it's so helpful using that analogy of the bricks perhaps to know that that conclusion keeps us grounded um, when it can be so easy for us maybe to, um, to lose our bearings and, and to, drift, to drift away uh, from, from truth. Yeah, so I think reassuring is a good uh, word there because once again, this is not just an intellectual question. This is not some speculative topic to which we can be indifferent. Uh, the reality of God or not is something that implicates everything about our lives. And uh, it is talking very much about the ground of our lives. And if God is not, then I am very not assured and I'm very much trembling and quaking. Um, so I think reassuring is a good word for that. Uh, what I would again point to is this distinction between contingent reality and absolute reality, or in Anselm's uh, terminology, reality that is per se existing or through itself, per the preposition and se the reflexive pronoun, through itself existing, that's what's absolute, that is something that exists just because of itself, 
and not through something else. If it existed through something else, it would exist in relation to something else. It would be contingent upon something else and therefore relative or contingent. Uh, that kind of reality Anselm calls what exists per aliud or through another. Now, again, if, if we look out into our experience, everything is stuff that so obviously exists through another, something that just doesn't have to be about anything we think of in our experience, we can always ask the question, why is it? Now, because that's the case, none of these things in our experience can be what upholds all being. It, it's not the ground, it's what's grounded. And so if anything really is there, if anything really is grounded, there is something beyond our experience something that doesn't exist through another, but just simply exists through itself that must be. Uh, is something for which, you know, the question, why is it there, no longer makes any sense. Now, there's an interesting way in which, you know, the scientific atheists of the world sort of get to this point as well, where they recognize that, oh, there's just something that's just simply there. You know, they talk about certain aspects of reality that are just brute facts, like the existence of the physical universe, for example. So they, they also understand that, oh, the mind sort of reaches a point where in order to account for everything, you have to, you have to posit what is necessarily existing. The great problem is that these scientific atheists posit something that so obviously cannot be the absolute as what's absolute. They posit the universe. They say, well, it just must have always been there or the laws of physics or whatever it might be. That's so obviously unsatisfying. It, it, that is not the necessary being, our universe or any other. We, we, we know from so many scientific reasons that we can ask why the Big Bang and, and why anything else physical. So the, the difference between the scientific atheists and the Christian believer here is, is ultimately not on this level of, of, of recognizing the necessity of some absolute, but in what we identify as the absolute. And they identify as something that patently isn't absolute. Moreover, the other point I'll make, and this goes back to again, what's reassuring is that if something like the universe is the absolute there or the physical cosmos, if that's what's absolute, if that's the, the measure of all things, um, that's not reassuring at all. I mean, that doesn't leave very much uh, space for history, personal life, love, all these things that we think are real, but must not be if the only thing that's really real is the, the impersonal abstract laws of physics. So the, the God of, of, of Christian philosophy is, is not only a far more coherent um, uh, candidate for the absolute, uh, but it's also the kind of absolute that allows us to search for beauty, for goodness, for love and communion, because all these things are contained within him as the absolute. All those things are not contained within you know, the, the fundamental forces of the universe or, you know, the, the Big Bang or anything like that. Those things are contained not in a physical absolute, but only in a transcendent absolute that's personal and intelligent and loving like God. So anyway, I, I don't know. Does that, does that help? Yeah, definitely. And I, and I think it's really interesting to me. I love the point that you make that there seems to be by, by people who use their reason, a recognition that you have to have an absolute. There has to be something. You cannot just have this constant regression of cause. It reminds me of, you know, if anyone in the, in our, our group here has small children and have dealt with the, well, why, and well, why, and why, and the endless why, why, why questions, it's lovely to have it and, and stop to those questions, right? That no, there is, there is a final answer to that. Um, but I love the idea that we all recognize we're searching for that. It's just, how you come, you know, come to the answer or what you propose as, as the answer um, is kind of what makes the difference. And, and maybe we could kind of go from that to thinking about looking around us in nature and, and sort of using what we see in nature as that sort of pathway to coming to understand God, which I think was a really beautiful section of, of, of your talk. Um, I like to think that it's it's almost like God giving us little little gifts or like almost like a little scavenger hunt, you know, that he hides these beautiful things in nature for us to discover. And as we sort of uncover or unwrap these things that we are learning something about the giver, we're learning something about who it is that that put those things there. And so I'm wondering, you know, how that transforms our experience of relating to the world if we're kind of 
come into it with that attitude, not realizing or, or not this sort of idea that we're making reality in our own image and we're sort of projecting you know, ourselves onto whatever it is we're seeing, but that rather we're like, we're like almost like children in a scavenger hunt or, or you know, a, a beloved who, who has, you know, the lover has left gifts and, and we're, we're sort of on this, on this journey to discover, um, you know, the, the one who's waiting for us at the end. Uh, maybe we could talk a little bit how that transforms our relationship to the world around us to think about it that way. Yeah, so if, um, if I take the position that uh, truth, justice, beauty, goodness, um, you know, masculinity, femininity, uh, the human person, that all these things are, are not things for me to discover, but things that I define and then project on the, the world of my experience, which is inherently formless, that it does not have form. In itself, it's not beautiful, it's not good, it's not male, it's not female, it's not personal. It's, it's just raw material for me to project my own ideas. If I take that position, uh, I, I've set myself up in a, in a very, very tragic uh, way. For one thing, uh, I think it's pretty clear that we can give up any speaking about the search for truth. You know, to talk about an intellectual quest, searching for truth, is, is to conceive of things where truth is outside and I'm in search of it. It's there to be pursued and recognized and then cherished. The projecting of truth is something where I, I make it up as I like and then, and then throw it out there. Another thing that I think we'd have to give up is if we're not searching for truth as something outside of ourselves anymore, but defining it each for his own sake, then we can also, I think, sadly surrender any dream for communion among persons. So if there is no objective truth or absolute truth to which we are all subordinate, no absolute justice to which we all stand before and allow ourselves to be measured, uh, I, I, how could we rally around as a community? Uh, Jean-Paul Sartre has this fantastic line in uh, No Exit, a play of his, uh, where Sartre, who is a nihilist and who, who thinks that, oh, actually, I do get to define what is true. I do get to create my own nature, my own essence. Uh, he imagines hell in that situation as being other people. He literally says in the play, hell is other people. He, and he's in the play, you know, created an afterlife where people are constantly frustrating each other because their projections are conflicting. And no one has the, the right to say that, well, this is really true because they're all sort of admitting that I'm projecting, you're projecting, and shoot, my projection is coming to conflict with yours. Your projection is forcing me to sort of back down on my own you are hell for me because you, you are causing me so much misery. Um, so that, that's, that's obviously a very sad way. Uh, much more delightful and again, much more coherent is this vision where we step into the world that we didn't make and holy smokes, it's full of beautiful, good and intelligent things. And every rock we turn up, everywhere we look, there's one more sign that the author of all is intelligent, beautiful, good, loves us, has a plan for, for all things. And he doesn't show up as any particular thing in that world because he transcends it all. And so he's in a way searched for in all things and he's not identified with any one thing in the universe, but he's always known and, and sought as the mind behind everything we see. I think that's so much more fun uh, you know, to, to believe that things were made through a word, not through chaos that I then get to fix with my own uh, definitions, but that things in themselves have a meaning for, open for me to discover and with you to discover it. And together, this search is drawing us closer and bringing us also closer to a paternal, loving absolute. That just, I, I can't imagine a life uh, more wonderful than that. Yeah, I think that's really beautiful. And, and I, I think, you know, going back to what you were saying about uh, frustrating Jean-Paul Sartre's vision of hell and this idea that we, we would just end up frustrating one another and we can't agree on anything, um, it seems that it would also cause a breakdown of communication, right? I mean, we would not even be able to, we couldn't have this conversation right now mm -hmm. if we didn't have some sort of agreed upon me, you know, method of having a conversation. If we didn't agree on the words we were going to use in the meaning, I mean, it gets as fundamental as that, it seems to me, 
that if you if we don't acknowledge that there is some sort of absolute there is something intelligible about our universe we can't even have a conversation with one another we are literally alone in, mm -hmm. the, in the universe i mean does that does that seem accurate if we're if we're going to go that far if we're going to go down the route that that start and so many other nihilists uh, went Abs down the absolutely up. absolutely it does get that far um you know the, the, so the 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 fact is is that our words are formed initially by acts of naming you know like if you're a child and you're learning language and it's like oh apple say apple and they say apple and so it all begins with a moment of trust where child and mom are looking at a reality and you know saying this has an inherent form an inherent intelligibility this is a thing and this is the word we use to speak about it apple uh if if we have a breakdown where we're no longer agreeing about this fundamental relationship between us and reality and that our words are meant to name real things, then language really does break down. And um, you see that in the culture wars, you know, the definition of a person, um, you, you see that in the definition of, of sex and gender, you know, are, are, these, are these hot button words, uh, names that we ascribe to things we discover out there and they may be far more mysterious often than we can contain in any one concept of our own. But nevertheless, our efforts to understand them are, are rooted in the fact that they are there for me to understand and not to create. Um, and so you can see how this, this uh, breakdown in communication happens if you look at the culture wars. But ultimately, it applies to, to the fundamental structure of language. And every word uh, begins in a communal act of, of us together looking at the giraffe or looking at the moon and assigning it a word and agreeing to be bound by the reality that that word signifies. Yeah, that's amazing. I think it's really important, especially now where I think language is being destabilized. I think it's really important for us to just sort of remind ourselves that, yeah, words are supposed to name actual things in our reality. There is, and that, that in and of itself signals intelligibility. The fact that mm -hmm. we can look out in our world and we can, you know, sort of going back to Genesis, the idea that Adam could go and name things mm -hmm. suggests that that is an, that is an action that, that is rational, that is intelligible, that makes things intelligible, it makes possible communion because we can then have a conversation about them, you know? And it, it seems to me there would be almost be no need for naming things if you were just yourself alone. Like, why would you yeah. make up whatever you wanted? Um, so maybe we can, we can transition mm -hmm. from that to the to sort of the last question that I have for you before we open it up for, for our, uh, our audience here to ask any questions they might have. Um, I loved the point that you made, especially right now, that you mentioned in the video that division and discord didn't have the first word and they won't have the last word. Um, and I, I wonder if maybe you could share a few thoughts on how, you know, kind of keeping our eyes fixed on this idea that we are in search for God um, and having that monastic heart and that, that sort of humility and, and the desire to, to find God in, in everywhere we look. Uh, maybe could help us navigate the really rough waters that we that we seem to be in. As I think for, for many people, I think it feels very dark right now in the world. Um, but this feels like a message of hope to me. And so I wonder if you had some thoughts on that. Yeah. Um, yeah, the trouble is I, I have always, I, especially, you know, with such a question, far more thoughts than, you know, than I know how to express and what would be prudent to express. And uh, fundamentally, I see myself as, as a priest of the church. And so everything I want to say is, is, is guided by that. And I would say that this message um, really is something that gives us hope. And it is something that the church can proclaim, uh, that all things were made through a word, an intelligent, loving act of speech, of communication. And if that's the, you know, the first word, it's also promised in the gospel that it's the last word, that Jesus Christ is Alpha and Omega. And so where we come from is peaceful, beautiful communication and love. And that's also where we're going. And this really incredible history that we share as a human race is ultimately part of that single drama of love and intelligibility. And so no matter how dark it appears, for the Christian, remember that it's Alpha and Omega, and those are two beautiful letters coming at the end of what is a phenomenal and exciting word that we're going to savor uh, for eternity. And everything that right now seems dark is, by God's gift, something that is just incorporated into one more layer of just how magnificent that word is. You know, if, if he could incorporate the death of the Son of God into that beautiful Alpha to Omega world, word, 
he could certainly incorporate, you know, our own ideological divisions and, uh, you know, botched elections and all those sorts of things. So uh, I, I have I have no um, no doubt in God's power in that regard. You know, another thing that I think this uh, this um, this this teaching or this idea that we've been discussing can help with is is humility. Because remember that the absolute that we seek, the absolute truth or the absolute justice is going to be something that is going to have a surprise in it for all of us because our minds are all relative, they're all contingent, and again, they're all in search. And so if, if I can understand my own intellectual life fundamentally as a search, then I, I don't see how I can't carry it out alongside anyone else who accepts to be in search. And that my only real problem is the ideologue who's already finished, who's already so convinced that he knows everything and has nothing to learn from anyone else. Um, that's the only person with whom it's not possible to search because he refuses to search. And so, uh, you know, people who are on the right or the left or Republican or Democrat or, or, or wherever, as long as they sort of accept that, uh, you know, let's all cast down the idols we've got in our, in our world and search for what is above us all, um, then I think we can begin to, to draw closer. And you see how, you know, in, in our culture, especially the media, where things have to be so quick, such a nice sound bite, then this is precisely what people don't have time for. They, they don't have time to search. They need to know now that I'm justified, the other guy's wrong. Uh, and so we, we just, you know, feed ourselves uh, little, little sound bites of indignation, rather than sort of shaking and trembling and being humble a little bit and recognizing that, well, gosh, maybe I don't know all that I'd like to know, and therefore I can search. In this regard, I'm kind of reminded of uh, Abraham Lincoln's second inaugural address, where he, he, he recognizes that, um, you know, the, the fact is, is that the, the Civil War at that time hasn't gone as well as either side has wanted, that the prayers of both sides seem to have gone unanswered in, a, in, an, in important ways. And he, he takes that, well, you know what, maybe the Almighty's purposes are beyond our own. You know, both sides feel that they're so righteous, but you know what, as chances are that, uh, the, that God has his own agenda in all this. And the, you know, the, and that's, that's something that gives Lincoln consolation. And I think it gives us consolation as well. And he knew that I, we were reading a biography of Lincoln in the monastery. And uh, when he was asked about his inaugural address, he knew that it would not be one that's popularly received in the short term. Because he says, people don't like to be told that the designs of the Almighty are not their own. And, and Lincoln was criticizing his own camp just as much as the other camp. And um, I think that's, that's a lot of wisdom from, from Abraham Lincoln. And I think uh, that can, can be healing for, for us to hear as well. Yeah, I really, I like that. I like the idea that maybe, and it helps us to keep perspective maybe as well, like what you said, that mm -hmm. in the short term, you know, we, we may do or say things that, that aren't received in the way that we hope that they are, but that we can maintain this hope that there is something else that's that's way there's another design right that, mm -hmm. that going back again to to kind of where we started with all of this conversation that there is an intelligent design and i i, I was just reading jeremiah this morning and, and it the wonderful line of of you know before i formed you in the womb i knew you right that sort mm -hmm. of idea of that god has a plan for each and every one of us we are here you know for a reason um and i think that's that's a really reassuring um reassuring hopeful uh, sort of a thing uh, but I do want to open it up it's uh, let's see we have probably about 10 10 15 minutes left I guess uh, so maybe we can open it up and see if there's any questions um, and then we'll, we'll kind of wrap things up after that uh, yeah it looks like we already have one from Andrew there I see a hand raised sorry go. it's actually Sarah Junker <laughs> oh, go ahead, go ahead. I didn't know how to switch the name on here <laughs> um, so one thing that I know for me, coming back to this argument, um, especially the using the terms absolute and contingent, like I can remember when I went to school, like went to UD and I'm in philosophy classes and you're learning these words and you think, oh, now I have a name for this thing. But and before then, you know, it can feel really exhausting thinking about these big questions, right? And so I, so there, 
to me, I don't know if, if it's a breakdown or a hurdle or I don't really know the right word to use here, but when you're talking about language being destabilized or, um, you know, limitations of vocabulary, just an understanding, you know, and growing the intellect or strengthening up the intellect, how, how would you say, um, does, I mean, does Anselm treat that at all? To how to teach this vocabulary? Or just even, you know, if someone's on their own, right? If someone mm -hmm. has these few moments during the day to have, yeah. or to develop a monastic heart, you know, and, yeah, and yeah. you're not in school anymore, or you're yeah, not in yeah. an intellectual community, it, it does sort of seem to be a natural kind of weakness in the argument mm -hmm. a little bit that if I don't know the term absolute, right, mm -hmm. then, then what do I call that, you know? Yeah because that is a very precise word to you. So I, I yeah. guess that's, uh, you know, I, I'm coming to it as someone who's already kind of been exposed to this vocabulary. So mm -hmm. I can engage in discourse about it in a, you know, a, a sort of knowledgeable way. I can, I know what I'm working towards, but for someone who doesn't, um, yeah. how do they, I don't know, cross that yeah. threshold? I think um, so. I think it's, I, if I've understood the question correctly, I, I, I really love it, and I hope to be able to give a good answer because um, this is, you know, a very difficult work, the monologion. And uh, you're right that to reach these words that are, we find satisfying to name very specifically what we're talking about, absolute or relative or something existing through itself or through another, these are conceptual distinctions that you have to do a lot of work to, to arrive at. And uh, most people out there in the world, they don't have the time or, or, or the fortune to be able to have such a you know, literary experience that would lead to these really rarefied words like absolute. Um, I think that uh, Anselm was also sensitive to that. Uh, he was a very literary person and he wrote this book as a, as a, as a way of teaching his brothers how to think about God. Um, and so he was definitely very careful about his words there uh, and wanting this work to be a guide for the act of thinking. But I think that ultimately these questions that, you know, that provoke the monastic heart are available to every human being who's searching. And the, the reality is that we may not always be able to name what's going on in our hearts and our minds. And we need the philosophers and the theologians to help us reflect on those experiences and name the landscape of our interior life. That, that's, that's something that's, that's an important job and, and we should be grateful that philosophers and theologians do it. But we're all living it, whether or not we can understand it as well or not. And the fact that, you know, only, so to speak, the elite, uh, you know, uh, team of philosophers and theologians can sort of name this landscape doesn't mean that uh, the rest of us don't live it. And it also points out to just how important the rest of culture is to help us uh, step into the rhythms of these thoughts uh, to, to learn to pray, to learn to identify God and worship him in our intellect and in our wills, even if we can't sit down and write a treatise about it. And uh, this is maybe one of the, the ways in which we can, you know, see what's so devastating about the collapse of a culture is that the, the intellectual, the philosophical aspect can become so thin. It could be some so right verbally and technically it's got the vocabulary right, but it's disconnect from the hearts and minds of all the people that it's supposed to serve can be enormous. If our poetry and our movies and our art and our architecture and our social norms, if all of that is not teaching us these insights in, in the integral way that they need uh, to be for us to really be sensitive to them. Now, just in my own experience, one of the easiest ways I have personally of, of running into these insights is um, just by being contemplative about my own experience. So, you know, for example, think of, you know, 2 Maccabees 7, of, of the woman whose seven sons are being martyred before her eyes. And as she, as she watches uh, the, I think Antiochus, I think is the Greek guy who's killing them. As she's watching him uh, kill every one of her sons, she, she comes to this insight into the creator where she's encouraging all her sons. She says, I don't know how you got into my womb. You know, the one who made you is far above us all. 
you know, but go now with your brothers and die manfully for his laws so that he might reunite us once again. And so I, I, I want to think that uh, that mother had this insight into the absolute that gave her the reassurance to, to, to watch her whole family, herself included, go to martyrdom. And I suspect that it happened in contemplation over her child, over the innumerable moments where, you know, somebody got a bruise or somebody did this, and she had to hand things over to a provident God, where she had those small little virtuous moments where she chose to subordinate her will to the will of the creator, to trust him in all of those moments where she, where she searched for him and loved him and therefore became more sensitive to his reality and apprehending it. Also, just to stick with Anselm for a moment, um, in, in uh, the biography of Anselm, uh, who had, you know, this great big philosopher and theologian, it talks about how when he was a little boy, his mother taught him, uh, you know, to worship the creator of all things. Uh, and how Anselm, you know, would be taught by his mother to kind of wander around the woods of Asta and, and name things, um, you know, in, in, in relation to the creator. You know, when I look out into the stars at night, I think so many people have that humbling experience where they recognize, I maybe can't spell contingent or relative, but shucks, I know what that is when I look at the stars. And I know that I don't have to be, and, and neither does anything else. And in, in, in sort of mirror opposition to that, you can have some apprehension of what absolute means. Or when you look at the horizon and you see the difference between that which I will never encompass and everything that stands between me and the horizon, which is so obviously finite and I could walk around it. Um, when, you, when, you, when you reflect on that, maybe you can, you can come to some insight into what the philosophers will name with, with technical expressions like per se and per aliud. I don't know, does that help, Sarah? It does help. I just... Uh, it's so funny coming back to like if you're listening to a lecture and you haven't been in a lecture for a while or if you're a teacher and you're a little rusty and you're coming back to these questions sometimes it can feel like you've never been exposed to them before so yeah. that's why I came with the, the question of vocabularies that yeah. um, it's exhausting like it can be really exhausting yeah you know for for anyone to just kind of always be in pursuit of truth yeah. And I guess for me, I just really value knowing the word because then I have like a place to, to sit for a minute and let mm. that sink in. Um, but if I was a farmer living alone, I don't know. <laughs> well, you know, it. Interest, interestingly <laughs> enough, I think that the farmer, he's probably okay. Yeah, you're um, probably right. The, 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 peop the people who are in touch with, with the natural who yeah. in everything they do encounter a reality that's intelligible and beautiful that precedes them, nature, they're more than likely okay. It's the ones who live in the concrete complexes that we make that yeah. are at greater risk for forgetting that the intellectual life is fundamentally about recognizing form rather than creating it. Um, so. Yeah, well, thank you very much. Yeah. For that. Say hi to Andrew for me. I will. <laughs> Um, unfortunately, I know, I know Father John um, has to go to class, and I think we're running out of time here. So um, if you have any additional questions. I have uh, at least four minutes if, if you want. Okay, well, we can, we can take one more if somebody's got a, maybe a quick one. But maybe we've scared everybody off. <laughs> I think I'll, I'll maybe just kind of round out uh, um, Sarah's question there too, and and thinking about the, all the different ways that we have of encountering these these realities, and I think that's that's part of the reminder. I think that's really beautiful is that um, we we discover so much. You know, we have so many avenues into um, these truths that we're talking about, and so you know we can we can look for them in in the stories that we that we love to read, and we can look for them in, in, in the natural world as we spend a lot of time talking about here. But, um, but there, there are so many places where, you know, if we're, if we're looking for it, if we're aware that there's something we are searching for, I think Augustine would say, maybe Father, you can weigh in on this, but you know that Augustine, with that really famous quote that he has of saying that the heart is restless until it rests in God, that in some way, we all kind of know that there's something out there that we, that we need to find. Um, and, and maybe we can just kind of end on, on a, a really short reflection on that, that idea of, 
of our sort of innate knowledge that there's something out there that we need to look mm -hmm. for. Yeah, I think that, yeah, that's a beautiful way to end. Um, and the irony is that you are doing best when you are dissatisfied, when you, when you are restless, when you know that this is not God, you know, that I have before me, whatever good and beautiful thing it is that I'm enjoying right now in this life. And so you stay hungry and you, you keep looking for what transcends all of it. That insight that allows you to relativize every little good, to cast down everything else as an idol, you're apprehending God in that moment. And that's what keeps you going. That's wonderful. Thank you, Father. Yeah. Thank you, guys. Okay, well, I'll go ahead and uh, wrap up then. A big thank you to all of you for tuning in today, um, especially uh, thanks to Dr. Valenzuela and Father John for the discussion.